Good morning. It's so good to have you with us this morning. Um, as we gather this morning, um, remember to uh, keep some social distancing uh, in place and uh, just enjoy this morning that we are blessed with by the Lord. Um, it's good to have you all online if you're watching. Um, I, I pray that you enjoy the service this morning. We're about to worship. You can uh, stand or remain seated if you like. Whatever posture you want to take this morning is okay. Would you join us as we worship this morning? We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your words this morning. If you'd like to take a moment and send a wave or an air hug or a greeting or a hello this morning, you can go ahead and do that. Feel free to comment if you're on online. This morning, would you continue to sing with us as we, as we join in worship as we sing Hosanna?
this next song that we're going to sing is um, called You Are God Alone, and it, it talks about God's character of the fact that he's not created by human hands. He's not dependent on any mortal man, and uh, he's not in need of anything we can give. It says that he's unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, and that's who he is. Um, and in this world, something unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what we need. We need that right now, today in this place. A father, a God who, who says, this is who I am, and it's okay. That's enough. You don't need anything else but me. And that's powerful. It takes a lot off our shoulders to say, God, you got it. It's not about what I can give. It's not about what I can do. It's not about what anyone else can do. It's all in your hands. It's all in your power. So this morning, as, as we sing this song, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the things that are, are on our hearts. What, what is weighing you down this morning? What is, what is putting worry in your life? And give it over to God. Say, God, you're, you're unchangeable, unshakable, and unstoppable, and you've got this. You've got what I have, and I'm going to trust in you. So think about that this morning as we sing this. You are not a God created by your hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You're the only God. 
pray together. Father, thank you so much that as Preston said, you are enough. So much more than enough for anything that we could face, anything we're facing right now, Lord, personally, in our families, in our nation, in the world. There are a lot of things that are going on right now, Lord, but you are bigger than all of them. Lord, sometimes we, we hold those, those problems so close that we can't see anything else. Would you help us to, to put those away for a moment and just look to you. Thank you for this time to be together and together to just focus our hearts and minds completely on you. To realize how big you are, how strong you are, how powerful you are, how good you are, and how loving you are. You are truly the only one worthy to have someone live their life completely for you, Lord. And so that's what we want to do this morning. That's what we want to do tomorrow. That's what we want to do this week and for the rest of our lives, Lord. And for the rest of eternity, we get to live for you, with you. So thank you for your presence here. Thank you for your presence with us wherever we go. You are so gracious, Lord, so generous. You give of yourself and give and give and give, Lord, and we want to give to those around us. Would you help us to be generous in how we use our time and how we use all the things that you've given us, Lord, that's, that, that are really yours, they're not ours. Would you help us to be generous, Lord, and, and see the peace and the joy that fills our hearts when we live like you and for you. We do come, Lord, maybe with heavy hearts, all of us have have things going on, Lord, and but, but you're our Father, and so we want to lay those things down just like a child would come to their father and just pour their hearts out, Lord, and, and just sit with their father. So that's what we want to do this morning, Lord, to lay those things down at your feet and say, I'm so limited, Lord, I'm so weak. I know that I can't handle these things on my own. Would you help me? I need help. <laughs> I can't do it on my own. Help us to lay down our pride and just admit that, Lord, in humility and say, you are God alone. You are on the throne. You have everything that I need. And so as we lay those things down, Lord, help us to leave them there. As we empty our hearts this morning of everything else, Lord, may you fill it with your spirit. Oh, may we be so full of you, Lord, that people would, would just see you in us, in our daily lives, without us trying, without us trying to manipulate situations or try to respond in the right way, Lord. May it just flow out of our hearts because you have changed our hearts and are changing our hearts from glory to glory. We love you. Would you be with Pastor Tim, Lord, as he brings your word? Thank you for your word and how it divides and goes right to our hearts. Would you cut us to the heart this morning? Would you help us to hear you and be changed by the power of your word and your presence? We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for worship and the opportunity to pray together. Good to be here today. Uh, it's nice and warm and comfortable in here now at 11 o'clock. Our plan is to be outside. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, may get a little wet, but that's all right. We know how to, in Michigan, we know how to dress appropriately, don't we, for the weather. We should anyway. And so um, our plan is to continue uh, outdoor services at 11 o'clock and through uh, one more week after this, through October, and then November, we will all be back uh, in the service, in the sanctuary, um, uh, and of course, still doing our, our online streaming. Children's uh, activities are in the second service as well, at 11 o'clock, and we have them going on today as well. So that just gives you an idea of some of what's going on. I just want to thank you uh, for a number of things that you do. One, the way you care for one another. We have a lot of people who are going through some challenges. Uh, challenging days, difficult times uh, in a variety of different ways 
the way you reach out, the way you pray, obviously such an important part of praying uh, for the needs of the people in the church, and a phone call or a text or a letter or something, a card that so many of you do, it just means all the world uh, to people to know that they're not going through this alone. Uh, and during this time, we can feel a little bit isolated. I know there are times I feel isolated. Uh, don't feel, uh, you know, we don't see each other like we used to see each other uh, as often. Uh, and sometimes when we see each other, we have to remain distant or we have masks on. Um, and so it is so good to connect in other ways. Uh, the, the emails and the text uh, that I have received from so many are just so encouraging. It just makes, it just makes all the difference in the world. We usually did that every Sunday as we walked out or something. Um, as we connected and now we have to do that in other ways and, and it has been so meaningful so thank you for all that you do um, and I want you to know that I'm still thinking of you and uh, we're still thinking of you and if you have any need at all please let us know uh, keep in contact we're going to look at John chapter 15 uh, John chapter 15 what a great passage of scripture this is uh, John chapter 15 um, where Jesus talks about abiding uh, beginning with verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So Jesus says that line, ask Whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. That is a pretty good message. That is, a, in fact, a million-dollar message. Many people have made a lot of money uh, by telling people that they know how to, to tell them the secret where they can get whatever they want. Um, 2006, uh, a lady by the name of Rhonda Byrne wrote a book entitled, actually, The Secret. It's sold like 30 million copies worldwide in all kinds of different languages. And in the book, she uh, basically tells us the secret of getting whatever you want. Um, and, and it's the secret law of, attra of attraction, she says. It's by changing uh, the way you think. It is a lot of the power of positive thinking and uh, thinking a certain way, and you will attract things to you. You will attract what you want by thinking a certain way. Um, Byrne says uh, that this secret is something that all the great teachers have taught. And in fact, she quotes Jesus in passages very similar to what we read this morning. All you have to do is ask, believe, and receive. Uh, for Rhonda Byrne, that is the threefold process. That is the secret. That is the key. Uh, ask, believe, and you will receive to get whatever you want. Well, Jesus does say that, <laughs> but I'm sure he doesn't mean it the way Rhonda Byrne talks about it or many other people who will say something similar. Um, because we have to be careful lest we take a verse out of context, and it is so very clearly when Jesus talks about it in this passage that it is in a certain context that he says, uh, whatever you wish for, ask, and I will give it to you. Um, in the context, it is what Jesus is teaching. In the context, we find Scripture. <laughs> uh, 
uh, that teaches us. We, we should always uh, interpret Scripture by reading other Scripture. It helps us understand it. If we come to something we don't understand, uh, we can always go to the larger Scripture and say, what are the, what are the larger themes around this, uh, discussions around this topic? And, and it helps us interpret. But one of the foundational teaching throughout Scripture is that we are not God. I mean, it is delusional for us to think we're God anyway, right? <laughs> uh, we know we're not. But one of the foundational uh, teachings in Scripture is that we should not act like we're God, as if what we want is ultimate or the most important thing in life. Um, in fact, the, the reason that the world is in the mess that it is, according to Scripture, is not because people don't get what they want, it's because too often we get what we want. That's the reason the world is in the mess that is in. Because what Scripture teaches us, the problem really is our hearts. There's something wrong with our hearts. Now that's different from what other people will teach you. They will, uh, other teachers will teach that uh, you should follow your heart. Your heart's always right, that kind of thing. That's not the biblical teaching. The Bible teaches that that there is sin in our heart. There is something wrong with our heart. And, and, and that problem, in essence, is us putting ourselves at the center where we become God. That was Adam and Eve. They wanted to become God. <laughs> um, they didn't want to stay the creature that God created them despite all that he had given them and the promise of the kind of life that he offered them. They did not want that. They wanted more. They wanted to be God. And so that is the, the problem with our heart. We put ourselves in the center and then our, our desires and our goals and our wants uh, become idols. We have to have those things. And so that in the, in the beginning, when you look at what some of people would teach about ask, receive, and believe, the idea that I can ask whatever I want and, and God is going to give it uh, immediately comes up against that truth that my heart isn't always asking for the right thing. Sometimes I think I want something and I find out that it's not at all what I really need. Uh, towards the end of the book of Judges, we read... Uh, some of the most violent, immoral passages in Scripture um, in the latter half of the book of Judges. And there's an explanation as to why it ends up that way. And, and the writer says, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. <laughs> that, that led to some terrible consequences. And what we find that happened after Judges, after that period was going on, that shortly after that, the people wanted a king. You, you see how that works. That's kind of the way it works. Uh, people began to become so unruly, it becomes so violent, it becomes so immoral that people say, we've got to have someone rule over us. Out of desperation, uh, we look for a king. We look for rules. We look for laws. We look for uh, someone to bring order to all the mess because we've gotten our way so much and it's brought so much destruction. And so Israel wanted a king. The kingship didn't work very well either because the problem, again, wasn't a, a political structure, a political system. The problem was the human heart. Until that's changed, it doesn't matter what kind of government you might set up. Some might be a little better at, at controlling human hearts that are sinful, but, but the problem is the heart. And so what the Bible teaches us is that the solution to the world's problem is not people getting what they want. The solution to the world's problem is God getting what He wants. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come in my life. May you rule over my life. May you get your way in my life. And so while I am personally tempted from time to time to buy the book that tells me, they can tell me how I can get what I want, <laughs> the book I most desperately need is not the book that tells me how I get what I want, but the book that tells me how I can get, let God have what he wants in my life. And that book has been written, of course. It's the Bible. <laughs> yeah. 
And these words of Jesus and specifically talk about that. These beautiful chapters, chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, putting them all together. You could add 13, which we talked about last week in the sermon. Uh, those chapters so beautifully describes what it's like to live as Jesus taught us to live, to, to allow God to have his way in our life and what it looks like. This passage in particular that we read in John 15 tells us the secret is not asking, believe, receiving, and believing and receiving, but the secret is abiding. That's, that's the main point here. The secret is abiding. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear fruit. Life is not about me getting what I want, even though there is a great temptation for us to wake up every morning and think that it is our hope that we will get everything we want. <laughs> but life is about remaining in Christ and allowing fruit to bear in my life. It is, it is, that is the goal, Jesus says. It is My life is to, be, to bear fruit for the glory of God. John 15, verse 16, just a few verses down. We didn't read this, but it says, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. For what purpose? So that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, my Father will give you. The reason the disciples are given the ability to ask and receive is, first of all, that they are remaining in Christ, they are abiding in Christ, but also they are given that uh, authority so that they can bear fruit for the purpose of bearing fruit for the Father's glory. The whole context of what Jesus says here is this idea of being a vineyard, being, God's, uh, being in God's vineyard. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are multiple times the nation of Israel is described as a, the vineyard of God. Uh, in the prophets, they will talk about how that God planted Israel in the world like a vineyard, planted Israel in the world like a vineyard to bear fruit. And the fruit was to be righteousness and justice and holiness. That's the kind of fruit that God wanted to see out of Israel. They were to be priests to the world. They were to be people who lived differently so they could introduce the world to who God is. They could reveal to the world who God was. You are my chosen people, but all the world is mine, and I desire for you to be priests to the whole world. People who would live differently so they could introduce the world to who God was. A nation that would be blessed so that they would bless others and be a light to the world. God said, I planted you, Israel, as a vineyard. I planted you in good soil. I tended, I cared for you, but you did not produce that kind of fruit. And so the prophets of the Old Testament prophesy about the judgment of God coming to the vineyard. And John the Baptist came and prophesied about judgment coming. And Jesus came as the final prophet prophesying that judgment was coming. He proclaimed judgment on the temple and judgment on the nation that God is taking away the vineyard from Israel. And now Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And I am planted in this world, and anyone who remains in me, remains in the vine, will produce fruit. Fruit is, is not for the vines, for the trees benefit, for the branches benefit. A branch does not eat its own fruit, does it? What happens to fruit that is not harvested, is not eaten by anyone? It rots. It goes bad. Fruit is not for me, so when I see this, I realize that it's certainly not self-centered uh, what Jesus is talking about here. Fruit is not for me, it is for others. When I see my life solely for my benefit, when I see my life as something solely that I can consume for myself, then my life goes bad. Now, it's not all that 
all my desires are bad. We, we, have, we have good desires, certainly. We have desires for love and joy and peace and meaning and significant. But when we put ourselves as the center, when we put ourselves as the ultimate, then those good desires become corrupted. Augustine says, we were created to love God. First and foremost, we were created to love God. And sin is love turned inward, where I love self. Sin is rejecting God. It is enthroning ourselves as God where we love ourselves first rather than God and we make our desires and wants idols and we sacrifice everything to get what we want. Look at the world. Look at the evil that happens in the world. Isn't it because people will sacrifice dear and precious things to get what they want? Augustine says there are, are two great loves Either we love God, which leads to the forgetfulness of self, or we love self, which leads to the forgetfulness of God. So yes, Jesus says, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you, but the purpose of that is, is bearing fruit of, of a life that glorifies God and blesses others. That is a fruitful life. Two months before he died, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, preached a sermon called The Drum Major Instinct. And he, and he talked about how that we always have this desire to be in charge, the drum major. We always have this desire to be in the spotlight for life to be about us. Uh, but he says that Jesus taught us the key to life is serving. And in the conclusion of that sermon, he, he imagines... Martin Luther King Jr. imagines his own funeral, his own death, which was just two months away. Of course, he didn't know it. And he writes, or he speaks, he says, every now and then I think about my death, and what do I want them to say about me? And he says, in the end, in the conclusion, after he thinks about all the other things they could say about them, him, he says, I'd like someone to mention, me, mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say on that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. That's what I want them to say. That's what matters. A fruitful life where our life is producing fruit that others are nourished from how are others nourished by our life how are they strengthened and encouraged by our life or do we just only take from them jesus talks about this fruitful life and that the key to the fruitful life that blesses others which is very helpful to hear is just remaining in the vine remaining in the vine our worship talked a little bit about that this morning the idea of of realizing that it's all through Christ. Staying connected to Jesus, that's it. Allowing his life to flow through us. And Jesus says, if you're in the vine, you cannot help but produce fruit. You don't have to worry about producing fruit. If you're in the vine, it will, you will produce fruit. If you're in Christ, you will produce fruit. So if bearing fruit does not come about because of our goodness, it does not come about because of our discipline, although all those things may be important. Uh, it, comes, it doesn't come about because uh, we work so hard. Sometimes we, we want to uh, have a life that gives because we feel guilty about being selfish, and so we go out and try to do something in order to give. Uh, we try to make a difference, maybe out of pride. I'm I'm going to prove that I'm better than other people. Uh, but, but fruit that lasts cannot be produced out of guilt. It cannot be produced out of, out of pride. It's got to be produced out of being in the vine. It's got to be produced out of that relationship that we have with Christ. That's the only way fruit will last. Why do I do what I do? Is it because of that relationship with Christ? Or is it because I want to please people? Is it because I want to be thought well of? Is it because I feel guilty and I need to? Is it because I, want, I have pride and I want to show how, how good I am? 
No, the, the fruit that lasts must be produced out of that relationship with Christ. The love that we have for Christ. Which in turn causes us to love others. There's a big difference between people who do things out of love and people who do things out of guilt. There's a big difference between people who do things out of love and do things out of pleasing people or out of pride. It's a big difference. So Jesus says to produce fruit that lasts, it's about staying connected to Christ, staying connected to the love of God, and then that love shares outward. John will later write these words, 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. Isn't that great? We know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. It is the love of God that we rely on that flows out of us. It is the love of God that enables us to bear fruit. It is that love of God that first of all convinces that I am deeply loved, which changes my whole perspective, when I know I'm loved and know who I am, then that love flows out of me. Jesus says, remain in me and love will course through your life, bearing fruit of, of joy and peace and righteousness and love. I love what he says in chapter 14, 23. Jesus says these words, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make, I thought this was really interesting. I read it this, this week and thought, that is, I don't know that I've seen it before, but I don't think I've thought about it long. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. <laughs> Jesus is talking about, obviously, he and his Father. And, and so we are invited into that fellowship Invited into that fellowship, into that relationship of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We will make our home in you. We will invite you into this fellowship. And therefore, the, the, the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit flows through us. Therefore, the energy that, that activates our life is the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the motivation. That is the drive. That is what empowers us that fellowship. Richard Rohr uh, wrote a book called The Divine Dance. He talks about a book about the Trinity. And he talks about a painting that was painted in, in the 1400s by Russian painter Andrei Rublev. Uh, it was, it was a, a painting that kind of came, and there's, there's a picture of the painting. It came from, uh, uh, first of all, from a Genesis passage where uh, these visitors visit Abraham and then we find out that God is visiting Abraham. And so there is this image of three uh, sitting together at a table and it's called the Trinity, representing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father in gold, the whole, uh, Christ, the Son in blue, and the Holy Spirit in green, uh, signifying life. Um, and so there is this picture and they're all three there and, and and what is interesting in Rublev's picture is that there is room for a fourth, fourth person at the table. And, and note that the Spirit's hand is kind of pointing down um, to that place as if clearing a spot or welcoming someone to that place. And at the bottom of the painting, at the, at the table, you see this rectangle, and it's very interesting. Uh, art historians couldn't figure out what that rec rectangle was, and it didn't seem to make sense what it was. And, and then some began to believe that that was, uh, that was where some glue had been put, had been placed to hold a mirror up against the painting so that when, you, when a person saw the painting, they would see their reflection at the table. Whether that's true or not, what a thought. That we are invited into that table, into that fellowship. And in this fellowship, we learn what love is all about. We learn it, obviously, from Jesus Christ. 
but the Father who loved the Son and the Holy Spirit who glorified the Son. This perfect fellowship, this perfect relationship we're invited into, what a culture to be a part of. Uh, some people will talk about businesses culture or, or, or the culture of a sports team and how that once you have a, a certain culture, then you immediately, good things happen because people who, who become a part of that team immediately join that culture. They're just get in part, a part of it. We are invited into that kind of culture. We are invited into that kind of fellowship. And how are our hearts not transformed when we sit at the table with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? And we hear their desires for the world. And we hear their dreams and hopes. How do we not obey? How do we not say, yes, I want to be a part of this? The idea that we could be a part of that fellowship and say, I'm sorry, I think my agenda is more important than your agenda seems absolutely ridiculous. In this fellowship, uh, we are changed. And it is this fellowship that empowered the life of Jesus. Jesus said, I can do nothing apart from the Father. And it is this fellowship that empowers our life as we are called to bear much fruit. Bearing fruit is the product of this relationship. Jesus says that there are some branches in him that no longer produce fruit. They are dead. They have lost connection with the vine. There are some branches that are dead and have withered, and they will be taken away and put in the fire. But then Jesus says the branches uh, that do produce fruit are constantly in need of pruning. If we want to be more fruitful, we have to prune, we have to cut back growth. Um, all growth we know is not good, right? Our, our cells, the problem with our cells in our body, they become cancerous when they've stopped, uh, when, they don't, when they no longer stop growing. All growth is not good. There are some things in our lives that need to be pruned, Jesus says. There are some things, growth in our life that needs to be cut back. There are some desires that are good, but they have their limitations. And if we take them too far, it becomes something that suffocates the life of Christ out of us when we let them become unchecked. There is always a temptation in us to pursue everything that seems like a good idea, to pursue everything that affirms me, to pursue everything that pleases me, to pursue everything that makes me look good in someone else's eye or makes me feel good or pleases people or to pursue everything that would make me admired or respected. But Jesus says there's a lot of things that need pruned. Those things need to be pruned out so that our life flows with the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've probably seen trees that have been recently pruned. It's, it's about pruning time. And we look at those trees and we go, oh my goodness, that person went way too far. They cut it way back. That tree looks like it's nothing. It used to have so many branches and now it's, it's nothing. It's empty, it's sparse. They've gone too far. We often think that, but... But expert gardeners will say, nah, no, we know what we're doing. And next harvest, you'll see what we're doing. So we all go through seasons of pruning. And they aren't easy because um, something needs to be cut off. Something needs to die in us. And that's hard. But the Lord prunes us so that we will be more fruitful. Maybe there's some hardship you're going through. Maybe there's some struggles you're going through. That is a pruning. Not necessarily that God caused the hardship, but God is using it in your life as pruning. He wants you to be more fruitful. His goal for you is to be more fruitful. As, J as Joseph said, uh, you guys meant it for evil, but God is going to turn around it for good. <laughs> and he does that time and time again. He prunes us so that 
we can remain in the vine in a stronger way. So how do we remain in the vine? Just quickly. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask and receive. In other words, when we ask, it's not even our words, right? It's, it's the Lord's words flowing through us. When we ask in faith, it is the Lord's words flowing through us. We, we, we hear the words of the Lord and then we live in them and live out of them. We listen to the words of the Lord. In order to remain in the Lord, we have to listen to his words. We have to hear what he has to say about us. Do we live on who he says we are? Or do we live on what other people say who we are? We are children of God, the Spirit tells us. We are not slaves. We are not servants. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are dearly loved children. We are more than conquerors. We are saints. Do we hear that? Do we listen to the words of the Lord that tell us who we are? And then do we allow that fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be the guide of our life, to be the direction of our life, to trust in Him and obey so that every day, it's not about my will. It's not about me getting what I want. Lord, how can I be more fruitful? How can... How can your will be done in my life today? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, it is remarkable to think that we have been invited into this kind of fellowship. Lord, most of the times our lives seem rather boring and sometimes, Father, even powerless and empty. Father, that's not the life that you desire for us. That's not who we were created to be. Lord, we are reminded today through your word that we are made to be in the vine, that we are made to live out of that deep relationship with you. That every word we say, that every act we do, that underneath it there is a foundation of, of, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the love that we experience there. Father, may we trust that love. May we trust that love to make that our priority every day, to live in that fellowship. To rearrange our schedule, to reorder our lives so that so that following you and hearing you is, is the most important priority we have. May we not try in our own strength. Sometimes, Lord, we've been exhausted as we've tried to, to do things in our own strength. Produce fruit apart from you is impossible. So, Lord, may we trust in you and may we live out of that strength and out of that power. Lord, may we hear the conversations between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May we hear what you are saying to us and to others and in our world. May we not judge a person without hearing what this conversation of the Trinity has to say about that person or that situation. May you be the, uh, be the constant abiding voice in us that speaks and directs and guides Lord, you are, you want to speak to us. My sheep, hear my voice. Help us, Lord, to do that. Help us to obey. And Father, may you increase our faith today so that we can see, as the Apostle Paul saw, that uh, we're seated in the heavenly realms. What a place. What a, what a place of honor. Why do we ever worry about other kind of honorable things? Lord, help us to see that and help us to live out of that reality. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, God bless. I'm going to read you, uh, pray a doxology over you. May God give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. Isn't that great? May God give you the power to accomplish all the good things that your faith prompts you to do. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live 
and you will be honored along with him. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so may the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless.